Ballam their home, Hackney their home, Brent their home. Yeah, Luton, Birmingham, they spread all over and they were helping to build new houses. And on those sides there were bombs that had not exploded. But yet they were brave, had no protective clothing. No, they kept on for the sake of the children to give a better education. They kept on. Yeah, they led the way. They had to come together. See, it said on the doors, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. So they had to find a way to put together money and buy their own homes. Yes, that's what they did. Our parents those days, both the Caribbeans and Africans. Yeah, but we're talking about the Windrush generation. They came on the Windrush. Yeah, those people came on the Windrush. Respect to those who came on the ship. Empire Windrush, the Windrush generation. From 1948 to 1971 We honour you and we salute you Sound Ministry That's right MBE They reached the heights Dizzy heights MPs They reached the heights The dizzy heights Doctors, nurses, graduates, intellects, artists, photographers, singers, financiers, big up Kushni, financiers, big up Kushni, came with a pound to the UK, seeking for his own future to make it brighter financed all the fashion industry made names of all those young up and coming talents right here in the UK yeah people like Kushni yeah also I remember used to be a record shop called Jetstar So looking at the Windrush, people came here with determination, they came here with fight, they came here with drive. There was a particular culture in the West Indies where they wanted, they, they felt that in order to be accepted, they had to conduct themselves in a certain way. And sometimes they had to overly conduct themselves. You know, so when they came over, they made sure they were dressed well. They made sure that they were always polite, even though they were not treated in that way um, in return, because people were really shocked. So when they came into these professions that no one else really wanted to do, they really dedicated themselves to create respect in their communities, to be accepted as equal. Although, even up to today, that's not always the case, um, which has been quite a struggle. And I think that's something that, that that generation really tried to drive into us. They really tried to sort of say to us, you know, study hard, get those qualifications. For you to become somebody, you needed to be even better than your colleagues, your classmates, the people around you. Um, so I know for my generation, it was that constantly in your head from all the elders to study. If you got a B, not good enough, get an A. <laughs> if you got an A, not good enough, get an A star. You know, get yourself in the extracurricular because when you go to get a job, that you having an A won't be good enough if 
somebody of a different culture does have an A, then you will always be passed over. So that gave, I know my generation, that determination to say yes, you know, okay, we've got our academics, but we came into conflict with our parents' generation because we couldn't understand. We've grown up in this environment, so we see the injustices for what they are and wanted to, in a sense, I suppose, rebel and fight for that equality. You know, I remember in my generation, we had things like TLC and, you know, um, you know, liberating Queen Latifah, again, liberating, especially as a female. Um, this is why I think we fared better than the males in our generation, because for the females, it was like, okay, we, we don't need to be that housewife sitting at home looking after children. We can fight for a career. We can dedicate ourselves to that. Um, if somebody doesn't respect you, demand that respect, fight for that respect. So that was ingrained from our parents, which was ingrained from their parents. Now, this is where it all gets a bit unstuck because now we've done that, we fought for that. Some of us did really well, some of us didn't. But unlike other cultures in London and in the UK in general, we, although our parents came together and they helped each other, or our parents and our parents' parents, to have some form of stability to them, even if you worked till you're dead and you never make it back home, at least you have your house, yeah? Mm -hmm. That was their pivotal thing. They needed to feel like they had some form of ownership. They had actually escalated from where they were. You know, back in slavery days, they were, some of them were promised land. Some of them were promised, you know, the right to build a shack on their, previous master's land or and try and build that but often for one reason or another it just it just didn't really work how it sounded in theory so they've come to the UK they've come because they were invited they've had their hardships they've had their battles they've had the racism you've had a lot of issues with yes single parent scenarios in our generation as well we've had the latchkey kids because mums are working, dads are working, even if you did have two parents, you know, because that's what it took. And they appreciated that this is hard work, that's what life is. So when our generation came up, like, do we want to work that hard? To, to mm -hmm. just, to be able to say, our house is in our name, is that enough for us? But the yeah. element that has been lost in the generation's children after the Windrush was that the family foundations were not put in place. So you didn't have grandma, who you would have had at home in the West Indies, there doing her little cooking and whatever, and then the grandchildren will come home and help with that and run to the shop and help with the washing. And yeah, so that um, grand grandchildren, grandparents, and current generation were all intertwined. The children would teach each other. You had a very old school family hierarchy type of scenario and everyone had a place and everyone had a role. Even the whatless one, yeah? He would still have a place. I was an 80s child. And in that time you had things from, you know, activism was quite strong during the 80s. We were talking about saving the planet and, you know, always being told even in the cartoons that you have you can be that person you can be that sort of mini superhero and make a difference um, Blue Peter was a big thing <laughs> at the time where it would kind of show you that you can create something you can you know you there were children all over the UK who were doing these things and achieving and being rewarded for what they were doing. So again, at that point, I don't think race was a big issue. It wasn't about that, it was about your potential and the fact that you have one. Um, 
and that shouldn't be limited by anybody, whether you're talking about Queen Latifah, whether you're talking about Public Enemy, TLC, um, you know, the artists at the time were so vibrant, so alive. Um, so then during this, this point, like, I suppose to our parents at the time, it must have been like, oh my gosh, you, you're going to get the police here, people. <laughs> We're knocking on my door. And then as we sort of got more into the 90s, I know for my generation, it, every, anybody who sort of went down a bit more of an intellectual road would become conscious. You would start researching your history. You would start understanding politics, socialism. You'd be looking into why science, which was my area of expertise. Um, science became, okay, but how does it work? Then I think one big sentence that really stands out to me, that all resonated with me, was don't just accept what you've been told. Instead, make sure you understand it to the point where you're explaining it to yourself and others so if you wanted to know whether your water was full of fluoride for example you would go and do that research as if you were the scientist and for young sort of adolescent people you've got that time and you've got that focus and so a lot of us did go down that road and people started to branch off some people became Nuwapian some people um, went into Christianity strongly some people you know just was like activism um, justice um, you know just trying basically we were all trying to find ourselves and where we stood in society because we all knew that if we had followed our parents' paths as much as they wanted us to, there was only so far we could go. And we'd already been educated through the media and the music and everything else that our potential was limitless. So there's a conflict then. There's a conflict of interest. And I think this is what we're sort of coming back round to. So, it, you know, for that reason, people... How can I say it? People fought in order to achieve. As we got older, we began to realise that, or feel as though our hands were tied to a certain extent. We're a very entrepreneurial generation. You know, we have seen and heard so many amazing stories, but we, are the generation that kind of made sure that any generations to follow know that you don't just have to go down an academic route to get there. We made people believe in themselves and their potential and that if they put in enough effort and focused and remain positive, they could create anything that they wanted to do. As we're coming up through this sort of struggle that we saw our parents going through, the hard work that they had to put in. Um, we at school, yes, we were more academic than, let's say, the generation that followed us. But we realized through what we were going through that why is it our parents are still having to work so hard? Um, just to kind of, get by with maybe a holiday at the end of the year if they're lucky. Um, for us growing up here, seeing other forms of wealth, other how other cultures were surviving, you know, whether you look at the Asian community, you looked at the Chinese community, we're all here as, in a sense, people that have come from somewhere else mm -hmm. without necessarily extended families and things like that, which is what we kind of sacrificed in order to be here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel that when this point came for our generation with all the social things that were happening at the time, you're looking at the media, the, art, the artists that were coming out, the music that was coming out, it was very much, you know, we need to fight for this change, we need to make things fairer. It's not just going to become fairer.
Hi Linford, this is Pam and your family in Canada calling to wish you a very happy birthday, 90th birthday. Oh, you're old. Anyway, this is um, you were here from the Charlotte of Dawn. and that is uh, Leah. Leah, look towards the camera and you can go give your names. Andre, David, Denise, Kai. <laughs> <laughs> the four Power Rangers. <laughs> Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Happy birthday from Canada! Yay! 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 Happy Good evening. Greetings from Florida. Happy, happy birthday, Mr. Wang. I wish you all the very best for this birthday. This is a special birthday. So I all I can wish is wish you health and happiness right now. And hope that you'll continue being the person that you are. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless. Enjoy. Hello, family and friends. Sending warm sunshine from Jamaica. It's so wonderful to be asked to be a part of this lovely celebration. Uncle Lynn, 90 years is quite a milestone. You would not have made it without your family, Jeannie especially, and grandchildren, and I'm sure good friends. I'm glad that many years ago you made the move to come back to Jamaica, otherwise we would not have met and known you and Jeannie personally. You returned to England, but you left behind those memories that will last our lifetimes. Jeannie was so quiet and shy, but I'm not sure if it was because she was in a strange land or if that is really how she is. Even though you say you're 90, you look so young. I'm not sure if that is true. You do well with the technology and impresses me every time you WhatsApp mom and myself, and it's so good to hear from you. I tried to put together some clips of birthday wishes and messages from my mom and my brothers. It was easy because Wade lives in Florida and Gary lives in Canada. I had to try to catch them while they were both in Jamaica together. So I wish you continued health and strength as you celebrate your 90th. Here's hoping you'll make it to the century. Cheers. So I'm still looking at when all's that anybody still got housewife? <laughs> <laughs> anybody got housewife and buy ducks anymore? <laughs> my mother didn't always put ducks in the air. Yeah. Why would she do that? Huh? Anybody ever use bergamot here? <laughs> she says grease my scalp. <laughs> you know sometimes you just, you know, but you're like, mom, you didn't need to put the, it was too heavy. It was too, it, I just needed a little bit of mousse. But anyhow, you know, because I do, I do love my Jamaican men. Anybody flying out right here? Yeah man, I love as you I do not even I just 
I just come off the plane. And they start looking at your eye, innit? You know that be there? You feel good, innit? And they say, yes. Yeah, man, my spirit lit with that yard. No, that's where man chirp you. Ladies, when do you get chat up? Yeah, man. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's what they're not trying to do, innit? If you could imagine living back then, you're 17, 18, you've come over the, for the first time in your life, you've got no adult, real adult supervision. You had a lot of the young West Indian girls who's come from the West Indies, they're now in these nurses' homes. So yeah, they've got their matrons, but they can sneak out the window, really, which is what a lot of them did. Then he had the guys, the guys were shirted and tied up on a weekend. Yeah, they've been working. Everybody's focus, remember, at that point was career. You've sacrificed, you've left your family, and you're here to build a career. So you're not really looking to get into anything like that. Because, of course, for you to go back home now and introduce that potential partner to your family, you've got to be established. You're not there yet. So it's all about fun. Yeah, you're living in a very hostile environment. So, yeah, fun is important. So yeah, you can imagine them going into the raves or you know, the girls in their little skirts and the guys all suited and yeah. So what you notice from, from that time is that majority of us, the generations that came after that, were single parents, families, because that wasn't the focus um, at that point. So a lot of the, these situations, the girls did get pregnant. But now they're pregnant in a foreign country, it's usually only in a one bedroom bed sit, really. Yeah, shared accommodation. You're trying to manage your night shift and your day shift and so you can have the child. And that's a lot of pressure. Where are the guys? Well, the guys are back in the rave, aren't they? Picking up the next girl, which seemed to be a common thing. So therefore, now, one of, for, for my generation, one of the classics were like, be careful, don't go and wind up with nobody in, in, a, in a party without asking their surname first because you just have to be sure it wasn't your cousin or your brother. So, you know, those things were joked about because they were normalised. That was a normal thing that could happen. Um, and many people have got stories of, oh yeah, I was talking to this one, I was talking to that one, and it worked out a couple of months later, a couple of weeks later, you know, yeah, they were related because families didn't come together. So because dads weren't always around or around to that level, you knew your dad. I have to say, the majority of people knew who their father was. They just didn't know who he was as a person. So now, can you imagine, right? You've got these hardworking women who are hardly at home. You've got teenagers raising their siblings because you can't afford babysitter. Come on, it's not that, that time. Hence the term latchkey kids, that was our generation. So then, from that now, you've ended up 13, 14, 15, doing all the things you'd expect a parent to. And if you didn't get it right, believe, you get lit that night, yeah? You had to make sure and take care of them and be responsible with what you were doing. Now, all of that meant that when we got to our 18, 19, 20s, often the men that we would go towards weren't always the best men either. They were very similar to our fathers and many women have sat down and had that conversation that, oh yeah, he's a cute boy, yeah, yeah, he's sweet. Why don't any of us go for the nerds? is the question and I think a lot of guys who are focused on academics also say the thing like what about us but it was just because that was normal to us 
it wasn't normal to see somebody who was steady, who was dedicated, who was caring. So if you've never experienced that, then anything like that makes you feel a bit uneasy. You're expecting the guy to want to go out and want to do what guys do because that's what you've been raised and observed. Now, therefore, I know from my generation that myself and my sister, we're about 15 years apart. We're very close because we share a similar experience. One family. It's very difficult to raise more than one family. In African cultures, it's accepted, and other cultures too, that a man can have two, two women and their children as long as he can support both equally. That was their understanding, right? Over here, they kind of took that and ran with it. <laughs> yeah? So it was a case of you'd have two, three, four different families for one person. He cannot possibly support all four to the same level and be there for each individual child, financially or physically. So then what happens is, it's left to the woman. The woman now is working in whatever career, most of them was in nursing, that, that's what most of them came over to do, right? So now she's working day shifts and night shifts, yeah? She's not at home, she's relying on the older children to watch over the younger children, right? So who is putting in place the family traditions? Who is putting in place the stability? Who is putting in place the culture? No one, because no one's home. Mum's doing her best, there's no blames on single parents. I am one myself, I know how hard it is, right? But that's the reality. And the value for that family is not there. The importance of living and working and pulling together is not there. It's a very individualistic society. And as the younger generation are now beginning to say, they feel that the only way they're getting in contact with their extended family is through social media. Because as a single parent, we can't all meet up the way you would have done back home. The reality is, when I was coming up, and a lot of people in my generation, we had so many opportunities. Because, as governmentally, or locally, in the community, it was understood that a lot of our parents were working. In a sense, the government put in place, as well as other people doing their personal projects, their community projects, we, we all guaranteed had a youth centre within walking distance. Yeah, they were dotted everywhere. You would have so many after school activities, whether it, your interest was the theatre. Myself, I was part of the Theatre Royal in Stratford. I did performances. I got the opportunity to write plays and have them perform, which then obviously gave me school base. I used to play basketball for uh, Waltham Forest. Sorry, Newham. So cut that. <laughs> I used to play basketball for Newham. Um, we went on tournaments, hockey. Uh, dance. I've performed in again in Newham towards Canning Town. They used to have a centre there. We used to go and do dance performances and we'd have paid audiences come to see us. Now imagine what that does to your self-esteem and your self-belief. Now you know all of those things we were allowed to play outside. We were allowed to go to the park with our friends. And as much as we can say, oh, well, times are different now, are they really that different? Because back then, there were still people kidnapping children, there were still paedophiles, there were still murderers, there was still gang violence. Come on, even before me, you still had the craze and God knows what else going on in these days. You know, but it was all undercurrent. Now, because of the way the media is, things are spun slightly differently it becomes more apparent we've got instant news as soon as something happens everybody knows about it 
So the problem is at the moment is the generations, our children, um, society no longer has those facilities in place. The youth clubs, the, the after school activities, the school does small amounts but it, it's not really that significant anymore. Now with the education system, like this is a holistic problem so there's many different areas in society that are leading to issues that we're seeing with the younger generation coming up. You know, um, I think what was it? Um, the police, head of police said this was the lost generation. He said that, you know, it's like they are, they are non-productive. Um, but realistically, a lot of these children have a lot of drive, but they're misunderstood. They want to achieve, but are often not heard. So, for example, I know um, my own child really wanted to to, to get into the sciences and really, you know, become an engineer and things like that. But the school were very much not pushing that aspect. Our generation realised that there was a limit if we weren't going to become entrepreneurial. And so we began to. The generation coming up after us now and our children's generation, they now have had the understanding that they can't work for nobody because if they do it's only so far they're going to go but therefore they've lost the aspect of the academia that was ingrained in us by our parents because they've seen so many people who do not have academia become billionaires so therefore it's not necessary to specialise in that area a lot of children will turn around and say you learn more from being on the street or living your life. The school system has not kept up with the times. The school system was created for factory workers, as you know, we know. Therefore, it's all about timetable, discipline, maintaining your physical urges, like going toilet, to allocated time slots so you don't affect the workflow. Now, the current workspace that our children are going into that it's remote working, it's about creativity, it's about reinventing the norm and making it better. This is all about creative thinking, thinking outside of the box, which we've kind of said, yeah, you, you don't have, through our example, maybe not so much through our words, through our words, we're still speaking our parents' dialogue, yeah? Go to school, get yourself educated, we're speaking it, but our actions show something different. And that's where I think the next generation have ended up running on a tangent. Because remember, a child will only pick up what they see, not necessarily what they hear. And out of what they see, they will only pick what is relevant to them. So they might see us hard working, doing this, doing that, and entrepreneurial, and think, yes, I can't be limited to a job, I can't be limited to a career, but ultimately, they've not taken everything that we've tried to pass down and that's where we become confused because it's like but you can't do that from your bed and they'll say yes we can Has everyone Thank forgotten you. that? Thank you. Where are the good photos? This is hey. photo man for the year.
I couldn't find you last night, so I called out. I'm not going to see you on the <laughs> and I want to call you. I want to WhatsApp you. What's up? No, no, hold on. You can't call me. Huh? My birthday is a bit of a birthday. Happy birthday. No present. I said, I said, what? Well, you're not going to. I'm going to. No, no little flowers. No flowers. Not even water, Chris. You know what, Chris? No. Thanks. Come to his house. I said, you want to go to cinema? You want to go to cinema sit down by egg over egg overpriced popcorn. You say no, come there's Netflix and <laughs> Netflix, you hear what Netflix? Yes. Netflix and chill. <laughs> no dainty daddy. No. And as I'm getting a little bit older, ladies and gentlemen, it's harder when you're getting a bit older to find a man for yourself. Anybody agree? Yes. Yeah. generation suddenly there is this massive growth in autoimmune illness that was never there before well it was there but not to the same extent why mental health is it and male mental health and female mental health I believe personally there's slightly two different pathways that they've gone in for women it's become physical as in they have the mental health stress I'm not talking about mental health illness necessarily because that's a different genre. Mental health stress has meant that we as women have developed a lot of things, IBD, IBS, um, arthritis, you know, the list can go on. Why? Because we're so focused on achievement, we do not know how to de-stress. We a lot of us do not know how to just relax and enjoy some company. We have to watch YouTube videos to learn how to chill a little. <laughs> yeah, that's saying something. Whereas our children, they don't because they chill 
predominantly mm. <laughs> and work partially. Mm. We've got it the other way around. But if you think about it this way, if you observe a generation that's work, 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 achievement, 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 that next generation, which is us, would very much be, okay, work, 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 it's important to relax, it's important to achieve, but okay, yeah, and you're thinking about it, almost overthinking. Our bodies have struggled because our body can't cope with the level of stress that we are going through. To try and achieve, we are worried about what other people think a lot because that is what was ingrained in us. You need to be worried about what other people think of you. So if you're not achieving, it's not good enough. Yeah, and then you'd worry, oh my God, are people gonna look down on me? You know, I can't get this right, I'm a failure. The generation that followed that, was like, I don't care what anybody thinks because they've learned through observ observation that if this is what happens to my grandparents, because all they care about is work, if this is what happens to my parents, they get, end up getting sick or they end up getting stressed and depressed because they're working but they know they should have a certain kind of work-life balance but they can't quite get it and they're stressing, then why am I going to repeat that? I need to create my own way of doing things. One that isn't going to result in me getting sick from stress-related disease, so I'd rather take on no stress. Instead, it's a weekend, I'm not getting out of bed until 2pm. Much to the mother and fathers, <laughs> you know. <sighs> I, I, I can't even think of the word, but yeah. If you look at the psychology of how a person works, if you put a person in an environment, they are not going to pick up what you want them to pick up. They're going to pick up what they feel they need to pick up in order to survive their own environment. So therefore, we might be sitting there thinking, we are showing them hard work, dedication, we're showing them determination, which is what we've been passed on. But in actual fact, we're showing them, unless we are earning millions, living in a beta house like on MTV Cribs, we're showing them that what we're doing doesn't work. And that, I think, is what we're not really grasping. So, Really, what is important in life is the question we've all been asking ourselves. Yeah, what is really that important? And when it comes down to it, it is experiences, community, togetherness. Those are the things that genuinely make happy, well-rounded individuals. All the rest is subject to the child, the individual, your circumstances, your opportunities. But you can have the poorest person in the room become the happiest person just because of how they feel inside not because of what they've achieved or not achieved yet you can have the person that's achieved the most had all the opportunities have all have had people behind them like the grandparents and the parents and the great grandparents pushing them and they're the most unhappiest unhealthiest person there and this is what i think we're also not understanding so in that situation, a child ultimately, you know, is its own individual. They have their own dreams and ambitions that we can't understand, just like our parents couldn't understand why the hell we didn't want to go and work in an office from nine to five. What do you mean you want to be an entrepreneur? What, what is that? That means no pension, no, no guaranteed income, no sick pay. Why? They couldn't understand, and we're saying to them, but you know what, yeah, we, we might not have a pension, but we can buy property, <laughs> which most people will talk about, that's our pension, mm. yeah, okay, yeah, we might not have the security of that job, but we have the security that we can push ourselves as far as we want to go, and when we can't push that hard, we can pull back a bit. We have that flexibility to control our destiny. And that's exactly what the young children are trying to do. But here's the issue. They have no resources. The education system, unfortunately, as much as I'm sure the teachers within the education system work so hard, they, in this country, they are not given the respect they deserve, nor are they given the pay to warrant them status in society. 
Yeah, as a trainee teacher, you're, you're coming out at 18,000, 19,000. Right? So, um, therefore, that education system needs to be updated. It needs a whole overhaul. Because you're not preparing children for the factory anymore. You're preparing them for a life of being able to think on the spot, strategize, use technology, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's not for everybody, but guess what? There are so many other skills that touch on that. They don't emphasize that. Remote learning, remote working, yeah? Where you get up in the morning and have to structure and organize your entire week. No one's watching to see if you've done the work. You have to do that. Self-motivation. Our generation, oh, we've got self-motivation coming out of our ears, right? But we didn't have the opportunities like they did to push that and to get people to see what we were doing. So we did them in small hubs in our local communities. The kids had the reach, but they just don't have that motivation that we do. My mother, she's from the Windrush generation. And she always used to tell me her stories, you know, they're very, she was very strong, she wouldn't take no nonsense, no matter who you are, at work and everything, and she would literally, no one took liberties with her, and she would tell the stories um, of how she overcame all that, you know, she would fight back, basically. So I had that, you know, there's times I had that in me, at the workplace, because in the work they would take liberties when they could, you know. Um, I remember going to um, Hull. Um, this is a design company that I worked in and you'd have to go down there at certain times to do the samples. So I remember one day um, I was assigned work to do. I'd go to home, stay the, the night in the hotel and go to the actual sample room where they're based. And uh, this other work colleague said to me, <laughs> she literally gave me her own work on top of mine. And I thought to myself, what is this? So I made sure I did my work and I had to get the train later on that day. And when it was near for me to get the train, I just handed it back to her and said, you know, take it, I've got to get my train. She goes, what about my measurements? I'm thinking, I've got to go and get my train. What are you talking about measurements? I, I'm here to do a work that's assigned from London, you know. I just looked at her and took, went and got my train. Okay, I come from the Windrush generation. I'm like these, my mum was a Windrush generation, my dad is a Windrush generation, and I'm like the second generation here in the UK. Um, I worked as um, a fashion designer as well as I've worked as a teacher. And, um, you know, being a teacher, you do have, you know, things you have to come up against sometimes from your work colleagues. And uh, I've always, sometimes my mum comes out and you put it that way. Uh, I remember one day, one of my uh, teachers said to me, Oh, Ethel, a new trousers? Oh, I'm thinking, what are you, are you talking about new trousers? This is how I've been brought up. You know, every time, like, uh, say, September time, we'd have new uniforms, new clothes. You know, that is how I've been brought up. That's the wind rush, wind rush generation. You know, if you see how my mum used to dress, how my dad dressed, he still dresses like that today with a hat and a suit, and they well turned out. And when my mum was around, she'd go to work and she'd dress up, you know? So don't talk to me about, oh, that's the new trousers. How far did your eye go to see that's the new trousers? God, you must have looked in detail. But I thought to myself, I just kissed my teeth in my head and I thought, oh, please, you know, I'm working for this. I can buy whatever I want. What do you think about this? Then? Beautiful, beautiful. I didn't think it would be so nice, but it is. It's really, really. What would your mum say? My mum. Con yeah. yeah, considering they involved themselves when they were. It would be like she's flying. Yeah. Yeah, like she's taking the plane on. <laughs> and the rest of the Windrush generation, what do you think? I think it's, it's um, from when they came here mm -hmm. to when looking at it now, it's mm -hmm. just so advanced. 
you know, they probably would remember certain things, what it was like yeah, around see, here. Yeah. And to see the change, it would be like just amazing to them. Is this fun as I really? like it? Yeah. Yeah, it would be really kind of out of this world, I it's think, for them. Yeah, because they've got so much memories before. So we've come far. Oh, I think we've leaped. Yeah, yeah. Look at I mean, just look at the amazing. Excellent. So, at one of the key things that this generation coming up, I suppose, is frustrating to observe as an older person, is their overconfidence. Because the problem with overconfidence is it means no one can teach you anything, nobody can guide you, and you're not willing to hear it because you're so self-assured but with no experience, no guidance, how does that work? Sorry. And no money. Sorry. <laughs> and no money. Um, you know, but they believe that if they portray this lifestyle, that they have the money, someone who has the money will buy into what it is they want to achieve because they're so confident about what they can achieve. But then here's where we're going to come into a problem in the next few years. And I think we're beginning to see this now. Confidence can only take you so far. You have to be able to back that with something. So let's take the gangs, for example, or the street life, yeah? If you're overconfident on the street, somebody at some point is going to pull you up on that. And if you cannot back it, as the kids will say today, then you then become the underdog. Here's a conflict already. You, you know, the, the whole gang thing is, is a very big subject, but that's just one aspect of it. When you're looking in schools, the kids who do have confidence, who don't feel they're given the opportunity, will fight for it. But the school will see that as aggression. They will see that as a person who's not self-disciplined, because that's not the way you show your achievement. If you are confident that you can achieve something in the education setting, your job is to put your pen to paper and prove it academically. Your results will speak for themselves. There are so many young children at the moment, especially the boys, um, who are so intelligent that they aren't actually progressing. If Let me explain that. So, if you can imagine a really intelligent child in the classroom. Their way of thinking isn't confined to certain structures and processes, like the educational timetable and curriculum is. So they're sitting in a class, they understand the concepts, and a teacher who doesn't necessarily understand the subject as well as they do is trying to explain it. They begin to get disruptive. They begin to start making a scene in the class. Not necessarily a big scene, but subtle things, messing about with their friends, talking. That then creates a reputation for that child. That child is always being sent out. That child is always sent, being sent to, you know, the um, headmaster or headmistress's office. That child becomes labelled as the troubled child. I know so many young boys who are extremely talented. If you were to sit down and have a conversation with them, you'd be astounded at their vocabulary, their, their way of connecting things, their way of strategizing things, which is the true depiction of what intelligence is. Intelligence is not an exam result on the end of a day that you did really well, yeah, because you could have had flu that day. So it's not a true depiction. Intelligence is your ability to connect multiple subjects together and to create strategies and solutions around that to solve problems, which is what this current society requires, problem solvers. But in the classroom setting, those children are the problem. But only because the method of teaching, the way our education system is structured, isn't there to support those types of children. Hello, um, my name is Manakai and I'm 13 years old and I am the legacy of the Windrush. Um, in my generation, we aren't really, I guess you could say, set in a certain subject as my elders would be. We're kind of just like spread out. We do like our own thing, I guess you could say. You know, if you could imagine your, your great great grandfather has come over to the UK with this vision, this dream in mind that he's hoping that his offspring 
your future generations are going to be so much better off than if he stays in the West Indies. Do you think he was right? Well, yes and no, I guess, because when people in like the West Indies, they were brought up to think that Britain is their motherland mm -hmm. and this is where everything happens. This is the perfect place to be where you get money, your dreams come true. But then like the generation after that and then after that realised that it's not that great but they carried on with it. And then my generation came and then we were like, hmm, I think I'll do my own thing now instead of doing what I'm told to be doing, I'll be a little risky and do what I want to do. And what does that kind of entail though? When you say do what you want to do or your generation wants to do, in the sense of what? Like, I guess since... Is it the rules and regulations or what? I guess like, like when I go went to my Nana's house, she would like, when we're having dinner, what she would say is, you're not allowed your elbows on the table, you have to have your cutlery in your right hand, can't stretch, because you're not a snake, and things like that, because like, we, we have to be the top of the top, the best out of everybody. We have to show example to the rest. And how about at home then? So you're saying that's what your grandparents are saying to you. How about in your home environment? Is it a conflict? Is it the same? Is it different? Well, in my house, it's different, I guess. Like, I guess you could say we get more leeway. Like, you'll come home from school, um, take off your stuff, you'll get into civilian clothes, might have a snack. That's a civilian clothes? Yes, as you say, mommy. Yes, I do. <laughs> civilian clothes. And then we would, like, instead of, as I think your generation would do, you would go home, start revising, do your homework. My generation would either go upstairs into their room, go into their bed, go onto their phone, their PlayStation, their Xbox, the internet, so the, um, just look at their social media and just see what's happening around the world and stuff. So more social rather than academic is your focus, would you say? Well, no, I, I wouldn't say that. Like, me and my friends, what we would do is we'll get set homework, we won't do it, we won't do it, and then maybe the day after, like, or depending on how we're feeling, if like we we'll really like this subject, we'll decide, you know, we're gonna do this right after we get it. As I as I'd mentioned, when your great grandfather came, he had this dream, this vision of what he could see for his future generations. In that, what is your dream for your future? Well, I, for me, I, because of my mum, she would like do lots of sciencey stuff, like she will have a microscope, she will start looking at it and she will never let me touch it in case I break it. And she like really liked science, she would let me watch documentaries about the, our planet, um, plants, animals as a child. So I grew up like getting interested in that. And then when I was in like primary school, or no, lower, like my lower primary school, like year one, year two, I used to always say, I can't wait to go up to the upper side so I can do um, mixing all the chemicals together. And when I got there, I was like, I still can't wait, but I think I'd rather down there where I got to play. Then when I went on to secondary school, I was able to do it and I liked it, but I felt like there was a lot of pressure involved with doing all of that stuff. Do you think that everybody kind of has an idea of what they need to do and where they need to go? Or you know what, what is the general feeling at school is it of frustration is it of happiness is it that they feel that they can achieve what they want to achieve well it depends really because like my year some of my friends were saying oh i didn't get to pick what i really wanted to do because my parents wanted me to do something else so they go to school 
happy because they like learning but then after that, like the end the or the subject that they didn't want to do they'll do it they'll do it but they won't do it to the best because they don't actually enjoy it so some of them would like fall asleep or just doodle or talk to their friends and get distracted so like in the playgrounds you know there's a lot of things that are going on in society at the moment um that obviously particularly around your generation what is the kind of social conversations that are happening around that subject matter it's so for example the gangs the violence that kind of thing are you guys worried about that or is it really is that an adult thing that we're more worried and concerned than you guys are well we were just like we'll talk about it and then like sometimes we'll like say it into a joke like when one of our friends and they'll just come out to say what 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 and they was like what are you gonna do what are you gonna do and then <laughs> just like joke around and then like start playing fighting like we call play fighting scrapping it's like where you i guess you have you grab each other on their back and then i guess you could call it kind of like super sumo wrestling so you grab your friend and then you have, you have to swing them and whoever gets dropped to the um for floor first loses well I guess you could say our generation is mostly materialised. Oh, Anybody had oh, Whoa! Wow. I said, not me. Oh. I don't have any problems. I'm a friend of a friend of a friend, friend, cousin, oh. friend, sister, auntie, uncle, and a tree. When you don't do it, I unroll you, roll you, Liam. And she tell me, say, it did hot the fuck and I to give me a wink, give me a wink, give me a wink. <laughs> <laughs> that in here. Amen, amen, hallelujah. You know it's bad when you go to the doctor and you want to sit on the couch straight away. They all sit down, you just like, please inspect me. <laughs> oh yes, I can see the people giving me no eye contact, you know. And then you get the cream. Have you seen the cream? Oh god. It wasn't me though. It was the friend of the friend. <laughs> I'm the of the world. I'm down the lid and round the main. I'm not me. I don't know about them team. You see the cream father? You know the brown hat, look how me go You see the cream, it's right in your But me never know, you know, it's not you But you know your friend He's in the house and you use the bathroom and you have the cabinet And you see the sitting in it It's serious, isn't it, Rastaman? <laughs> like in observing, like, my own child, it's 13 It's, it's amazing to see what they're capable of um, programming, designing, you know, just just the whole, like, obviously the computers, you're sort of torn between two places, because on one hand, you're thinking it's so important for you to be out there enjoying day-to-day -day life, you know, go out, ride your bike, anything but the computer, but, you know, at first I used to think it was a really bad addiction, the coming home and just wanting to be on this computer, and then um, the STEM teacher actually pulled me aside and said to me, do you realise how intelligent your child is? And the computer is a very safe way for your child to de-stress after being at school. Because um, he works really hard at school. And I was like, yeah, but it's a lot of time on a screen. And he said, but it's social. He's also learning fine motor skills. He's also learning strategy. He's also learning teamwork. All of these things I never considered was part of a computer game. Um, and for the current world that they're going into, where at work you are going to be video calling people and, and things like that, these are really important skills. Um, so then, you know, you, as parents, you sort of sit down and say, is it the computers that are making them a bit despondent? Is it the computers that are, you know, making them a bit aggressive or abrupt? Um, but then, you know, as, as they'll say to you, it doesn't because they don't behave the same way as they do on the computer. Music for that generation is, well, <laughs> mm. they've got some very good beats. From my generation's perspective, we question the lyrics sometimes. Now, I know, for example, my older children, their music is very grime orientated. So when I'm hearing that, although I might really feel the beats, I'm like, ooh, it needs some work, it needs some work. 
Whereas I notice the younger generation are actually, so around the 13 year olds, are actually becoming quite eclectic in their music. Um, from It's like a fusion of these mixtures of different styles of music. It's really quite liberating to listen to. Um, and that really surprised me, looking at my older girls and their style of music and how it's evolving into this new fusion. Um, so music, like my music playlist, I do listen to grime, I guess you could say, which and drill, which is, I guess, it's a very violent beat, I guess, sometimes. But then I also listen to like old school music, like, um, One Wish and stuff like that for my mum's age and then there's like my nanas and my granddad's like stuff that they would listen to but like remix with a different beat and then like changed up to make it sound you say more modern and electric and it sounds really good but depending on who you are changes what music you listen to I would say that Jill is the majority of what my generation will talk about. Like, Jill, there's, they'll talk about oh, who has a better Jill artist, um, who's a better Jill artist, um, Banal K or OFB, which is a gang that makes music. And, like, if you watch a documentary about them, the gangs, they would also say that they're, th this place is like, they own it I guess you could say and whoever lives in there is part of their family. We like drill, we like pop, I guess you could say we like modern beats, some of us even like old school beats and some of us like, I, I, I just don't like, I'm, remember that song that I was playing in the in car? The, yeah. What would you describe that as? And I said that was like a outcast fusion, so it reminded me of outcast and their kind of music, very eclectic, pulling on different musical genres from different cultures, even. Uh, very sort of liberating, which is what I thought was quite good. Now, I know with the, the obviously the, the grime, and, and to me, those things remind me of hip hop, where people were speaking out about what they were living in reality. Yeah, and then yeah, over time it got popularised and therefore people were making up stories about what they were living. Um, but then you had like, even at the moment, bashment is still a big thing. Yeah, teenagers are still dancing to bashment. Um, yes, it's gone very um, explicit, <laughs> but it, it was like that in our generation. And I'm sure in its subtle ways it was like that in the generations before. Um, you've got things like... Uh, our garage and drum and bass you know when you're listening to the beats that they're putting in their music the pop what they would class as popular music our pop was Madonna yeah their pop is what A1 A1 no it's A1 sorry they they it's not like they would make up names like I don't know like like let's say my name they would do get the first letter of the name and then one and then some random thing like like some of my friends they would just start calling me m1 ops for some reason okay or and some of my other friends we call them like a1 which is just standing for Aryan one it's because in our generation we it was children were seen and not heard you wouldn't speak when adults were speaking, and you had no authority. It was very much the adult's world. You were a silent participant until you came of age. In our generation, in our children's generation, they don't even understand that. They don't understand that look that a parent gives when you bring home a friend who they don't approve of, and a parent doesn't, like, and go about their business. If you showed a child that now, they wouldn't get what was happening then yeah because as parents we haven't done that to our children we have tried to instill their self-respect their dignity we've got a set of rules in the back of our mind of what it takes to raise a good happy child unfortunately a lot of our children are not happy per se um, because 
obviously, as they're coming up, they've got the authority to be able to butt in in conversations. We're on the phone and they walk in the room, they, are, they feel empowered enough to be able to say, oh, mom, I'm just, whilst you're not waiting kind of scenario, children these days will um, get in your car and automatically they're hooked up to your Bluetooth and whatever music you were listening to <laughs> yeah, has got sidetracked because there's an element of importance. They are important to you. They are your child, so therefore they have the right to do that. That's us, that's on us. Um, because of the way our parents were, would naturally classify that as disrespect. And if it was our generation, we would have got beaten for that. <laughs> but because the generation now, our parenting is more liberated. So therefore we're very liberal in how we manage and discipline, where we would more talk and reason and explain. You know, even, I don't know if, if, if people remember, not so long ago, it was all about the naughty step and counting to three. Well, that's kind of fizzled out now because it doesn't work. But, <laughs> but um, you know, that's kind of fizzled out now. It's no longer such a fad. So we wanted to empower our children with all the things we thought we didn't have. We thought if we were given the chance to speak up, if we were given the chance to offer our opinion, because obviously we're educated here, we're, we're coming up here, our parents don't always understand that, then maybe we would have been able to do things better, you know, contribute, make our parents' lives better. But it's kind of backfired a little bit, because now, you know, the term entitled children, and I don't think the children are doing it maliciously. They're not doing it because they want to be disrespectful. They're not doing it because they want to be rude. They're doing it because they feel that that's the norm and they have the right to do so. When you said that we feel entitled, I, it's not, we don't feel entitled or like, you're, we're important to you. Well, we are, but we're not like, we don't feel like you, you need us. Yeah. We kind of, we're there and like, when we play our music, I guess it's just a way that we express ourselves, I guess you could say. So you don't even look at it as a disrespect. No. It is just you being you. Yeah. You're doing you. Yeah, it's like... You do you, and I do me. No, no not like that. It's like... How do I explain it? So I do this, you comment on this, I change this, and then we go forward. I wouldn't say, like, if I had a child, I guess, and then he came in, or her, she came in and started playing her music or his music. I was like, hmm, what's that? And I, if I like it, I'll say, I don't really like that, change it to another song. Or I like it, hmm, what's, the, what's it called? And I, I'll just make a comment. And if I want to play my music, I'll just say, no, I want to play my music and then just connect it. But then this is the thing. Hi, my name is Morph. I'm a rapper from South London, and today I'm here to talk about my story, my relationship with the Rin Ross generation. Being a music artist is uh, very important to have great influences when you're releasing your music and creating your music. The Rin Ross generation were able to bring back their family traditions as well as their inspiration in music over to the UK and were able to inspire generations like myself to infuse styles that we bring to the world today. Influences such as ska, reggae, even going back as being an MC to the MC battle days that we had with artists such as Bounty Killer, Ninja Man on stage which has been able to keep that competitive edge when it comes to music. So the Windrush generation have passed on through culture, they passed on sound, they passed on the sound system culture as well as um, clashing through that as well so just having that as a historic bed to go on is a good um, way to carry on the identity in the future and future generations. Well, from my perspective, it's 
understanding and um, a lot of what they faced coming over and seeing the struggles within that and seeing nowadays like appreciating that for whether it be the same things that we go through but have already been dealt with through that generation and once we pass that legacy on it's something that we um, you can see we appreciate it as well and we're able to go places from that legacy what's really important to us as a generation is our identity we're really thankful that our Windrush generation has been able to maintain and educate our generation and keep our identity alive. Ellen, how are you doing? Hope all is well. You don't look a day older than, 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 than 90. <laughs> yes, I'm I hope you, I don't know if you remember when I came to the, to the house um, some almost 20, 20 years ago. And I saw that, that thing on the wall, which was some kind of old response in case of emergency. And I, and I kind of played with it and I said, no, 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 the people are might, 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 might come thinking that I have an accident. And I, and I, and I wondered, why a young man like you had this thing in the house? And now I realize that I might even need one in the house now. <laughs> so, happy birthday. Uh, you, you know, as I say, you look like a very young man. And I was asking Mama whether or not she reached 98, uh, close to that, but she, she won't continue to deny her age. But I hope that we can see you soon. So you take care, and all the best from, well, uh, you know, Gary and, and his family, and Mama and Karen. So you take care. Yeah, okay. Uncle Lynn, how are you? Hope you're very very well. <laughs> um, I remember when you brought your car down, the Triumph, yeah, yeah. and uh, you left it at Anne Crescent um, under the Aki tree. So yeah. um, we were very fond of you, and um, <laughs> thank you that uh, you came and visited us uh, often. So yeah. okay, have a good birthday, and all the best to your family. Bye. Birthday wishes from my family, Wade, Karen, Gary, and his wife, Navi. I hope I'll be able to visit you soon. I am happy we are able to talk to each other on the phone often. Give my love to Jeannie. Bye. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, darling. Yeah. And you don't really care yeah. It's really worth fighting for 
Yeah, yeah, this is what fighting for. Yeah, yeah, this is what fighting for. Fighting for, fighting, fighting for. One, two, one, two. Two, one, two, one. You, one, you, one. It's really worth fighting for. Uh, uh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it really yeah. worth fighting for? Mm. Do you care? care? Is it really worth fighting for? Mm. Mm. Freedom comes at a cost. Fighting for, fighting for, fighting, fighting for. One, two, one, two. Fighting for me and you. Fighting for, fighting for. Oh, <laughs> 